book is disintegrating. It's the only one in existence besides this one from the library. What is the book? We won't go into that story. No, we won't. <laughs> um, it's called Prayer, the pra its practice, and its answer, which is what inspired this class because it is the book. If you don't read anything else in Unity, you have to read this book, and now I'm going to tell you it's out of print. Yeah, there's no way to get it back. <laughs> yeah. And who wrote this book? E. V. Ingraham. Okay. E. V. Ingraham, who was Mark. Hi, Mark. And 
and Myrtle said, uh, you cannot add anything to your credentials with that outer ceremony. If you have not a genuine calling and you cannot demonstrate the fruits that Jesus promised, you're not ordained, no matter if you have that piece of paper. And so with that, I will welcome all of you out there. This is New Foundation Unity. Um, our topic tonight, um, consider the lilies, how they grow. Okay. You'll recognize that title. I lifted it from Jesus. Good role model. And it's based on this book I was talking about. So if you tuned in a little earlier, you would see this is a most precious and rare book. And after I tell you how inspiring it is, I'm going to tell you that it's out of print and you will not be able to find it. And mine is falling apart. And for those of you um, who knew Stan, and I think everybody here does remember Stan, except for possibly Kevin. Um, Stan, who was a wonderful, loyal, every Sunday kind of person at UCU, a heart of gold. And he left UCU, and it was some years ago now. And I, not only did I leave the church, but he left Unity. And I was the fortunate inheritor of all of his Unity books. <laughs> and about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I picked up this one. I thought, hmm, <laughs> I've never read this one. I have read other books by Eva Ingraham, one which you can download on Mark's website. It's called The Silence. Okay, Meditation in the Silence, um, everything to do with the silence because that was the foundation of unity. <clears throat> Um, and so here was this book, and I was absolutely blown away by this book. It is so profound. It is the best unity book I have read on the topic of prayer. So, and it's out of print. Don't even bother to try. I've tried the internet and all of its various rare book sites and even tried to charm the new archivist over at Unity Village to give me their copy. Haven't managed to do that yet. But if you ever see this in a used bookstore, or it comes up on the internet or on eBay or something, just tell me. Okay. So um, if you're having any technical difficulties, um, for you at home, uh, you may email Mark right now at uh, mark at truthunity.net. And uh, later on, around about 8 o'clock, I will invite you to join in our conversation. Uh, and by you may call us at 816-301-6304. It's on your screen if you're tuned in to truthunity.net. And so as we begin our time together, I invite you to find a comfortable place in your seat and close your eyes. And as we turn within, let us acknowledge that we are now and always in the presence of pure being. Let us now consciously recognize that truth. The one source, one substance, one source of infinite good, one source of infinite possibilities. 
And for a few moments, a few minutes, in the silence, let us rest in that awareness <clears throat> that we are one with that one power and one presence in the silence.
as we begin to return our attention to this time and this place. We give thanks that we have access to this source of infinite good at all times. That we can return again and again. And we say thank you in the name and through the power of the Christ that lives within us all. Amen. <clears throat>
ACB says that the whole purpose of prayer doesn't matter what form, it doesn't matter what you're praying about, or even the result that you get, because the purpose of it is to expand your capacity to know the power and presence that animates everything from where we all come, from where all form comes, and from which we derive our aliveness, if you will, our vitality. <coughs> well then, and here's where I give the title. He said, consider, Jesus said, Consider the lilies, and you know, consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. Okay. They neither toil nor spin. And yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed as one of these. <coughs> so I considered that. You know how a lily grows? I mean, I learned a lot. Here's what a lily bulb looks like. Okay, and so you all did get a picture of the lily bulb because we're going to consider. Aha, uh -huh. consider the lily. <laughs> so if you've grown lilies, this might be elementary for you. You grow flowers. I, I agree with really you. Like, it's supposed to have that or not. They're good to eat. Good to eat. <laughs> Did you notice the Rose of Sharon? Probably by supposed the way. to be the front of the Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's the full blown lily there. You can have a, a, a lily bulb. <coughs> Here's the interesting thing, that the process of growth, that as the bulb starts to express itself in 
its capacity and that built-in capacity to grow into a fuller expression, this part, that hard shelf part of it, begins to decrease, to disintegrate, to be absorbed. And so little by little, that decreases until there is that full manifestation of the lily. So, sound familiar? The inner has to increase, and as the inner increases, the outer decreases. And the same, of course, is true without so we'll, we'll use that analogy. Now, the bulb of itself can do nothing. It pr initially, it draws its nourishment from the bulb, but as it begins to express, it has to put down roots into the earth, it has to put shoots up into the air, and how fast and how well it grows depends upon its capacity to draw from the substance, the earth, the water, the air, the sunshine. Without any of those things, you would not have this. So, if you went and bought some bulbs and just let them sit on your shelf, <laughs> you wouldn't just get this. Okay. So, how is that like us? Well, we grow spiritually when that memory, that inner memory of the image likeness of God wakes up in us. And that has been there planted from the beginning, before the world began, that image, and we are here to express it in its likeness. And the prayer just that sustained attention on that deepest part of ourselves, because prayer is really not so much, well, Jesus warned us, it's not words. You know, he warned us, don't be like the Pharisee and speak prayers to be heard by men, because that desire is fulfilled when men hear them. And that's all they get. They don't get that increased capacity of that increased awareness of the power and presence within them. And so the prayer is that impulse to express. It's built in to us. And at some point, and it happens to everyone, at a particular stage of growth, that memory wakes up and it's revealed to us. And then as we progress, more and more of that power and presence gets revealed. <coughs> and I was thinking how it's like the journey of the Israelites through the desert, through the wilderness. You know, and at first, what did they know? I am that I am. Okay, so we're told we're made in the image likeness of God. Everybody knows that, right? But then, as they meet challenges, and with a little hope, <laughs> the little help from their friend Moses, they discover how God functions in different ways. And oh, God provides for us. <laughs> and remember when they were given mana to eat? Mana means what is it? And it's kind of like that when you have an experience.
experience, a, a revelation, you say, what was that? Oh, I'm a spiritual being. And then, no water, right? So they complain to Moses, and Moses sweetens the water. Oh, God is our help. So God not only provides, but God God heals. And then they go on and show and each time God gets a new name, you know, it becomes just <laughs> like this. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rabbi, Jehovah Shalom. Oh, God is peace. Every time they discover a new way that God functions in life, they add a name to it. And that's how our awareness of that power and presence within us begins to grow until the end result is just like in the lily, no longer are we dependent upon that initial initial awareness of, oh, I'm a spiritual being, I've made the image and likeness of God, but we become that image likeness until it fully manifests. And we have Jesus who demonstrates that fullness. I wanted to, and you can each have one of these if you would like, but this is called one solitary life. You know, that nothing that you can accomplish, nothing that you can, you know, in any way describe as your possessions, whether you're talking about some status or, or some actual physical possession. It, it doesn't matter any of that. And here's what it says about Jesus. It's a long thing, so I'll just read a little part of it. <clears throat> he never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. So, you want to any more of these? I've got them. Oh, that's from the book. Um, this is a poem by somebody who is quoted in the book. But is that not true? You know, it's, it's um, I've done enough memorial services to know that, you know, you usually look at what that person has accomplished. But what do people remember is, in terms of the impact on their life, is the love, the memories, the good times. Isn't that what you remember about well, isn't that why we have memorial services? We can say, this person touched my life in this particular way. Maya Angelou has a poem about that. Something like, uh, it's not what you do or say that you remember, it's how you make it feel. Okay. 
Yes. That's right. not a good rendition, but something like that. <laughs> well, Jesus also warned us against something called vain repetitions. Now, it's perhaps not what you think it is, but it's more an attitude of being mechanical in how you pray. You know, that you do it this way, and you do it this way, and you say this affirmation, and you know, okay. It's, prayer is an attitude of the heart. And all the other things that we pray about, you know, um, it all starts with a desire. So what's the desire? I desire to be an artist. I desire to be a teacher. I desire to be a writer. I desire to be a musician. We all desire, we all have these desires, but those desires are secondary because they are the effects, they are the channels through which that expanded awareness of that power and presence moves through. We all share one desire, but it's the creator's desire to express in and through us, and it expresses as a longing. The creator longs more sometimes than we do. The creator longs to express in and through us. And once that desire wakes up in us, we need to put it first. We need to reorganize our priorities. This is a preliminary step, and we need to make a total commitment to the highest first. The first purpose of prayer is to expand your capacity to receive that infinite good that has already been prepared for all of us. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, so we don't have to beg God for anything because God is not unwilling to give us anything and always responds to our good desires, desires of the heart. It is so important that whatever you do in an outer way, then serve that basic desire. And that basic desire, at least from the perspective of spirit, is to be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay? God desires to move through us until that expression is full. Like this flower. We're all beautiful flowers in the garden of God. Now, Jesus used the word Father for God, and yes, it was a patriarchal culture, we acknowledge that, but it's more about the relationship, that intimate relationship between Father and Son. So not only do we not have to beg an unwilling God, but we have to realize that God is right here, right now, like intimately close to us, which is why Jesus said Abba, which means Daddy. Okay. So, you know, we might have the image of this stern patriarch. Many still do. Um, so, what is the prayer? The prayer is in it's really a prayer of growth, you know, that we grow in that awareness, and that takes many forms. 
But all of those forms serve that one desire, which to, is to enrich our capacity to experience the power and presence. And by the way, if you're confused about anything, stop and ask. Well, I have to say that I've never been a fan of be perfect. Mm -hmm. I just sort of thought, yeah, you're yeah, right. <laughs> but, but in this context of, you know, let that perfection develop as opposed to, you know, that, that, Absolutely. that uh, makes, yeah. Yeah. It makes it easier to swallow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, because that longing is not going to go away because until it is perfected. And oh, guess what? We have an infinite depth, and in the possibility of infinite growth, it never stops. So the perfection keeps on keeping on. But I realize that, you know, and I speak for myself that I just see so many parallels in those Israelites wandering in the wilderness. <laughs> and, and I've been conscious of the need to enter the silence for all these years. Sustained attention on that power and presence within. That's how we become acquainted with it. We become acquainted with it, then like the lily, we incorporate more and more of that into our being until we are it. Yeah, you want to say something? I'm going to say something to what you said. As someone who's worked with flowers intimately for 45 years, you know, there is no such thing as a perfect blossom. There is not. There is. There are ways that a florist goes to make it look more perfect. And it's really interesting because the beauty lies a lot of the times in the in imperfection, the yeah. which is what <laughs> makes it perfect. Mm -hmm. It's paradox. It's 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 so full of paradox, which I love the paradox. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so where where was I? Let me see. Let me just see here. Okay. So and and so that impulse to grow it just keeps on keeping on, and we become more and more like God. You know, Jesus said, "I can only do what I see my Father." doing. It is, and Paul says somewhere, says, I live, but it is not I, but Christ that lives through me. And then Eric Butterworth, he has these phrases that are very um, memorable because they're catchy. And he says, create the conditions in consciousness that make that growth inevitable. Okay. Um, and so once we have that initial aha, I am a spiritual being, then there are certain things that we are encouraged to do. This is we're in the book once again. And it's that once we see that, we, we have this phase of a devotional prayer where that is such an awesome thing to discover that your essence is spiritual. And so you keep your attention on that. And that, so that's one thing, sustained attention on that truth that you are made in the image likeness of God, that you are. 
a spiritual being and that you are here for the purpose of having, of being a beneficial presence to those around you. And secondly, practice. You know, it, it, sometimes prayer is considered the court of, la of last appeal. Um, and you know the story of the, the woman on the sinking ship and asks for, you know, what's going to happen. He said, oh, well, it doesn't look too good. <laughs> and so well, what are we going to do about it? Pray. Oh, has it come to that? <laughs> and so when we resort to prayer in a crisis, um, the prayers often are not effective. And you say, but my prayer wasn't answered. The ship sank. Okay. Um, and it, it's kind of like you have to practice anything if you want to develop the skill. What if you, you know, you wanted to be a musician and you started out by um, trying to play Rachmaninoff's <laughs> No, you have to start with scales. Yeah. And then you practice, and you practice, and you practice, and then pretty soon the music begins to come from you. And it's not that you desire to be a musician, it's that you are becoming the musician. And it takes practice. And what if you wanted to pass an exam? You're a student. Well, don't you study ahead of time? Well, some, most do. <laughs> and if you a musician, you practice before you go to a concert. And if you are, and if you want to express that perfection, to any degree at all, you have to practice entering the source, the silence, where that perfection exists and begins to express in and through us. In a few more minutes, I'm going to ask people to call in. And of course, our starting point in unity is to know the nature of that power and presence to whom we pray. And again, we look to Jesus. Where is the kingdom of God? Within. We have to turn within. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, when you were talking about the sinking ship. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've kind of been jumping around it, but we're, a lot of people are consider prayer to be request as opposed to development. Uh huh. And I've been listening to some nine eleven things, and people say, "And I prayed." And as I was thinking back over the ones that said that, these were people who probably had um, a pretty fundamental idea of what prayer is, mm -hmm. but they were practiced. Yes. I mean, so <coughs> it, it came naturally, even though mm -hmm. it was a request, mm -hmm. as opposed to an, a fulfill, an unfolding, mm -hmm. um, it's the familiarity that, that, or the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that does it's, it. It's, it's something that has, they have done for a long time, mm -hmm. and so they become habituated to that. Uh, absolutely, until it becomes unconscious. Well, I can, and and so most of you, I think, have heard this story. But I have to tell you that in a crisis, and this was for me, it was a real life and death crisis when my car drove off the road. Okay, but you just meditate. 
there was nothing Absolutely. else I could do. <laughs> you know, yeah. here's my car. It was right side up. It was still running. It had it gone you know, down this embankment. It was midnight. It was freezing cold. There was nobody around. And I thought, you know, in my human mind, I'd say maybe the fuel will last until morning. And then, and then I'll stay warm, and then maybe somebody will come along and see me. So I closed my eyes, because I am so used to doing that. Okay, closed my eyes. It was not even five minutes when I heard this man's voice saying, are you okay? You know? So even though it wasn't a request, it, it was it was a maturation so that perfection could unfold. Well, so I there's no way I could figure out how to get out of that situation. There was no way. I can't. I of myself could do nothing, and so I turned it over to a power that, you know. But quite often we say. Okay, I'm going to pray about this, and at the same time, doubt that anything is going to come of it. Have you ever done that? I'm really praying for this person's recovery, but I know he's going to die. All right. Um, okay, so then what does the universe support? The universe supports your intention. All right. Um, and so a lot of people who do that, who just resort to it in a crisis, find that they're liable to dismiss prayer as largely ineffective, and they dismiss it as like a superstition. There was a time in history, and it was pretty much during that Victorian time, when prayer was considered okay for women and children, and oh, occasionally for the general population, but as a daily practice? No. no. It's rare. And working at Silent Unity, and Dean's work at Silent Unity with me, and always it was a laundry list of troubles that they wanted us to fix. You know, well, let's take a moment to be still. <laughs> And people, all the time. yes, and people call in times of crisis. There's nothing wrong with that, but the effect over a period of time doesn't increase your capacity to know that you have resources within yourself that you can. You can still ask for help to enhance that, but if I got one call when somebody said, I know the truth, but I need to hear it reinforced. And we do that. And I mean, we can do that. I mean, all of us, I don't know, you guys but call Silent Unity? Eric, oh. I, I, I mean, it just yeah. seems like you do, I do. Yeah, I have. <coughs> I used to more than more I do than now. You do that. <laughs> um, no, but you realize that you do have a capacity within yourself that you can support people. You can support people. Now, what Evie Ingraham has done in this book is to say there are four stages of prayer as it unfolds. And as I told you, there's a couple of preliminary steps before you even get to the part where you can make a request. Oh, okay. So the preliminary steps, I talked about one of them, and that's, you know, a devotional aspect. Give your whole commitment to what is most important and then let all the other activities 
be those that support it. So if you're a musician, then yes, you want an instrument. Yes, you want music. Yes, you want opportunities to play. Yes, okay. So these are all activities to support that. But the activities are outlets. Okay, you're not praying for the musical instruments. You're playing because you want them, because it's your avenue, your path of service to express that presence and power of God to the degree that you're aware of it within yourself. All right, so that's one of the preliminaries. And the second one, well, you have to practice. Okay, you have to, because it's a new mindset. You have to totally change your perspective. It's now seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else that you need will come in support of that. And so we have to look at how we use our time. And that's how we sort through. This does not support it. This does not support it. It doesn't mean that things are bad. It just means that it isn't serving as an outlet for what we are here to do, which is to express the power and presence of God to its fullest. OK, so then um, it's what he calls the preliminary step of the devotional aspect. And the second step, be grateful for the awareness of what you do have and make use of what you do have. And then we get to stage one, which is the prayer of asking. Mm. And I'm not going to go in, because we're going to go into these in more depth in the following lessons. So the first one is the prayer of asking. And there are scriptural passages that are the foundation for this. Ask, seek, knock. You know, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Um, and knock and the door will be open. Okay. Or ask whatsoever you may, whatever you will, in my name, okay, from the consciousness of that source within you, and it will be given to you. Okay, that's the prayer of asking, where you expect, you absolutely expect that everything's already prepared for you and you're just laying claim to it. Then there is the prayer of believing. Ask believing that you have already received. All right, that's a little bit more. You know, sometimes we ask for things, but <laughs> we have no feeling that it's already there for us, right? Yeah. Okay, and then we have the prayer of silence. The prayer of silence, now we really begin to have a capacity for spiritual power when we can, from a place of silence, project our desire. And it's, oh, the Father knows what you need even before you ask. You know, the answer is there even before you ask it. Okay, and this is, wasn't, isn't it in silence? We have those, that leopard bowing his head in silence. And then finally, this is the prayer, the prayer of demand, he calls it. It's, this is a prayer of dominion. It's like, pick up your bed and walk, <laughs> you know. What is that word? Demand. 
I can't, it doesn't look like demand on it. It looks it, like desire. looks like desire or something, device. Uh, um, to say demand. Anyway, it, it should, decree. Decree. decree, decree, sorry. That looks like decree, yeah. Yeah, decree. Um, pick up your bed and walk. Be thou made whole. This is, you know, um, to Lazarus, come out of there. <laughs> And when you can speak that with the kind of authority that says, I know, I know, God, you're listening. And I know you always listen, but I, I want to convince these people that you're here. Okay, so, um, and what did Jesus do? He gave thanks in advance. And we know that's a good thing to do, but we rarely do that. You know, it's easy to be thankful or when someone gives you something. But to give thanks in advance for something that you have no idea you can have, or be, or do, to give thanks for that. That's, that's the prayer of decree. Yeah. That's what we call spiritual dominion. I have a question. Yeah. It's been a while since I've read uh, Eric Butterworth's book on prayer, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. The universe, the universe is calling. Yeah, the universe is calling. Um, and I, I sort of be, remember being a little frustrated because he doesn't seem to like prayer of asking. He seems to be saying that if you're asking for something, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm not remembering it right because it's been quite huge. If you're asking for something, by definition, you don't believe you have it. And so, by asking for something specific, you're sort of, that's really not prayer, and because you're sort of saying, well, I don't have it, um, therefore there's a possibility I won't get it. Am I off on that? Um, so, I mean, it seems that this approach is, and, and even we have, you know, seek and you shall find, knock on the door, it sounds like we're supposed to ask, and we're supposed to ask in my name. So. And I know well, that means that's deeper than just saying Jesus. It's, it's okay. uh, the consciousness of you know, Christ. But. Well, that's where a consciousness of the power to which you are praying is important. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, and he says, you must go to God direct. No intermediaries. Go to direct. And if you go direct, and you know that the power is there within you, then you can ask, but you don't have to beg because it's the Father's good pleasure. If you even go to the point of saying, uh, it doesn't appear that I have something and I feel like I need it, you know, you will, it will be given unto you, but you have to ask in the right place. Okay, you have to seek in the right place. Like you, you wouldn't go to um, CVS and ask and demand some tires, you know, and they'd say, well, we don't have tires. At least not right now, but eventually you probably <laughs> we don't have tires. Well, I want tires. You know, I need tires. Right, no, okay. Right. Yeah. So you don't beg. You go to a place where you know. And you may not receive what you, you may feel that you lack something. But once you go to the right place and you know that God is willing to give you whatever, then that is helping you to grow in your capacity and grow in your awareness that there is a willing, loving presence that will give you anything. And maybe it happens in baby steps. You know, that's different from just going and saying, I want this, and you're not looking in the right place. Um, and sometimes you get something that you didn't know was better than what you it, asked for. That's exactly right. So you <clears throat> so you leave it open, you know? And it kind of like holding up my cup. It's empty, <laughs> all right? 
Put something in there. Put something in there. I don't know what I need. Just <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so maybe in thinking about Eric Butterworth, maybe what he's saying is he's trying to get us beyond a superficial kind of asking on this, as as if what was someone once said is it's not as though God is uh, like a servant. You can say, hey, um, can you get a yeah. or you know we're at a restaurant. I, I would like you know blah blah. blah. He's trying to get us to, to deepen our consciousness and to to understand that um, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us many rooms yeah. in our Father's house. So maybe it's just more of a trying to reorient us. I don't know. But it, it did it when I first read it. I thought, oh well, okay. Then how do I actually pray? I mean, what am I actually doing? <laughs> Well, going into the silence is a prayer. Right. Uh, you know, I I had to learn when I came to Unity. I mean, this sounds funny, but prayer was never words for me. And I had to learn. That's why I went to Silent Unity, because I didn't know how to put that into words. And it's not about the words. It's about the intention behind the words. I think one of the things I like to think about it all is that, you know, in, in brain dominance thing, we're talking more right brain than left brain. We're in such an analytical culture that we think that asking and receiving is a sort of very logical, analytical, and it's really more poetry. It's the poetry of my soul that's speaking. Mm -hmm. I can tell you I don't believe in the prayer of asking. I don't believe in it, but I can also tell you I've done it a hundred times today and I'm going to do it <laughs> 200 times tomorrow because I do it. It's not like it's not like a mental thing that, oh, I'm going to get a list of things. And I'm gonna, I've done that in my life, but it's like, oh, i got to really get there to the bus on time. God, get me to the bus on time, you know, slow down the bus, you know, whatever <laughs> it takes, work on my behalf. And I think that's, like I say, I think it's made it easier for me to think more in terms of poetry because somewhere along the way I have to give myself a break because otherwise I'm always asking instead of how does this work, why isn't it working? Because I can give a thousand, thousand examples of how my intellectual state isn't working, but my soul can give a billion ways of how it is working. Yes, okay. So let me, uh, let this be a question to everyone, you out at home, <laughs> and anyone here, is that the effectiveness of prayer is not necessarily the answer or the result that you get. But have you, let's say you don't get to the bus on time, all right? The bus doesn't slow down for you. Um, so then you have an opportunity to um, grow in your understanding of how to meet a particular situation with equanimity. With equanimity and the benefit of the situation when it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Yes, yes. Well, to, to still be looking at the benefit. Because I think when, when I do the asking, it turns my eyes to the looking, to the seeking, to the expecting to receive. It's, it's like a, a, right. a circular process that, that, that if I'm asking, my attention goes to, am I getting it? Okay. And how is it working? Yeah. You know? It's helped me so much uh, to practice uh, asking for the highest <laughs> and, uh, and to release my idea of what the outcome well, is. Well, and think again in terms of the lungs, of how you breathe in that awareness of the presence and power of God. You breathe it in, and in breathing it in, then you release the carbon dioxide, uh, which is of benefit to the trees, all right? And at the same time, you're releasing what is blocking your awareness 
All right, so it is like poetry. It is like uh, the inspiration and the expiration. And everything, that's how we grow. It's the process of releasing and expressing. Releasing and expressing more and more. Um, it's uh, time for all of you at home to call in if you would like to join us. 816-301-6200. Um, 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 so any aspect of prayer and its practice, its answers. Um, but if you enter the silence, but, you know, uh, as I said, Linda de Prima, uh, she didn't come tonight because she said she did, couldn't miss her afternoon meditation. And if you know how that, I mean, I miss her, but that warmed my heart that she would put <laughs> what was most important first. Um, so you said earlier, uh, and I've heard this in different versions, um, and I've heard it in different churches. God desires to move through us until we have the full expression of that, like God and likeness of something of that nature. So that statement gives one the impression that there's this being, this entity, this phenomena that can desire. Um, one, God desires implies that there is that there is someone, something desiring something, some someone. I mean, we think of ourselves as desiring something. What is desiring? Okay, because usually in unity we don't think of God as a sort of a personal having a personal oh, quality. You see, I don't. I I. You don't get that at all. I think no. that God out here and up there, um, that's the personal being that rewards and punishes so and judges. So what does judges. that mean to say that, you know, I mean, that God desires okay. to express in us, Jim Fleming, Kevin, Dean, Yankee, Bart? Yeah. Uh, what, okay. What, uh, Desire means of God. It's a built-in impulse that comes with being made in the image of God. Built-in desire to express. Before you do any activity, no matter how simple, I'm going to brush my teeth. You first have to have the thought before you can act. All right, you have to have the desire, that desire, built-in desire to express, has to wake up in you before you actually say, oh, I'm a spiritual being. I need to reorganize my priorities. I need to put my spiritual life first. It's more important than any relationship. It's more important than any activity that I do. Because if I don't have that, I don't grow. It's the desire to grow that is built in to... That's our desire. That's our desire. It's the creator's desire or the creative principle's desire to act in and through you. We are points of awareness in divine mind. Right? Points of awareness. Um, we were created through this projection of God's desire. God had this desire. God's desire, you call it the creative principle, if God makes you think of a person, the creative principle says, which is infinite, I want to express fully through a, a, a biological being. I, I want to incarnate through a physical being. Well, let's see what, what we need to do that. And then creates all the conditions necessary for our physical life, all the conditions necessary, and then let us make man. 
in our image and likeness. And that desire to be like God, that's the desire, that impulse to grow into that perfection. It helps me to think of evolving energy working toward more and more good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I also think I, I like the question because, again, I go back to the poetry and theopoetics. The desire is the poetic word for something that has no words. And, and the impulse is not just the desire of me to have what I crave in my life or anything. Desire is also the wind wanting to blow. It's also the bird taking wing to fly. The, the, the impetus of desire in whatever the creative principle is, which ultimately for me is mystery. It's, it's like desire is one of the first steps of being able to talk in some poetic way about the mystery that we hold in here, but we can never explain. But to, to identify that in our process, we are processing with the mystery. Mm -hmm. Just sort of my... That, 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 yeah, that makes sense. And I think one could think of the universe as having a desire, nature having a desire, yes. and yes. creator in the sense of... Creative principle. Well, in the sense of creative principle, but in the sense of some huge unbelievably conscious um, being that we can't even conceive of. I like that idea. That, thank you, thank and, and when, like even Alexander, when he has this experience that goes on for what, t two weeks, a month, where his, he's brain dead, essentially? According no, to one week, one week. One week? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but it's a long time. I mean, 24 hours times seven, <laughs> how many minutes in that, how many seconds in that? He is more awake than he's ever been in his life, and he's in this this incredible reality um, of this huge love that's there. I like that idea. I, I found I find that very inspiring. Think of I mean one of the things I like to think about actually I think about this a lot is our scientists can now count two hundred billion galaxies, and in each galaxy there's two hundred billion stars at least. Think. I mean, beyond anything our computers can calculate. And it's like the impetus to allow all that, to bring all that forward. And that's just probably a mm -hmm. minute well, of what really exists even in this time-space reality where you can count galaxies. And we are a universe. To ourselves. Every cell in our body, and there's a hundred yes. million, a hundred trillion cells in the human body. Every one of them has infinite impulses of intelligence and desire. Yeah. Doesn't it just leave you standing in yeah. awe to put this sort of puzzle of the mystery together uh, and to yeah. be able to think I can walk into this mystery and be in it? Well. So that, um, I mean, Jesus speaks in images. You know, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, and yet they are provided for. Why don't you know that you are? It's that same instinct of, that is within every other aspect of nature has been, it's in us too, but it has to be cultivated because the intellect has overshadowed that aspect of our being for so long. It's a real change in perspective. You talk about Dr. Alexander, this was a 180 reverse because he believed, and there are still psychologists and therapists and doctors today who believe that consciousness is a function of the brain. It is not, okay? It is not. And he had to change. Dr. 
Larry Dossie, the same thing. He did not believe that prayer had, he, he thought of prayer as a superstition. He thought of prayer as um, kind of like you carry around a rabbit's foot and hope that something will come out, the, or the mantis, you know, it's uh, on that level. And so, but he did agree because he was a real scientist and he did agree to test it out. And so with all their double blind, triple blind, etc., studies, and nobody knew who was praying for whom and, and he was a cardiologist. And so the conclusions did show that people recovered more quickly when they were prayed for and they were being prayed for by all different religions and prayer ministries and everything. And what did he do? He did a 180 and said, if a doctor does not pray with his patients, he is irresponsible. Yeah. He also looked at the healings that occurred at Lourdes, you know, these sites at Lourdes. And what they found was they, they looked at the characteristics. And these weren't medically documented. They had to have medical documentation. So people with like, you know, completely ruined limbs and then they were better or can cancer that was like completely eating away everything. <laughs> they had a new leg, basically. Um, and they had like before and after pictures and it's in the medical literature. But what they, they looked at, the characteristics of the people who had the healing versus the people who didn't. And the people who had the healing had this very innocent kind of state, not where they were like, yes, I'm gonna do this and this is definitely gonna happen and we're going for it, you know, gonna win this game, kind of that kind of attitude. It was more people who just had this innocent kind of openness, hopeful, certainly, and an expectation, but a very open mind. Um, and not it also didn't include people who were like, oh well, I'm gonna go to the Lord, yeah, probably won't happen. They they didn't also get, they didn't get healed either. People who were more sort of in the middle, which I thought was really interesting. Almost like they were more of a receptacle to whatever higher good came. Then somebody had a preconceived notion. There are different out. degrees, obviously different degrees of of receptivity. That's because that's what is how how receptive are we to receiving spiritual power from the silence? Is it just a mechanical exercise? I think for some people it is. Is it just a technique that we do and we get it in and do it casually? Or do we do it reverently and with devotion for a long time? Practice, practice, practice um, until you carry more of the silence with you. And then you can speak what you speak with more authority. I had the experience once. I went to a conference and there were two speakers. They were speaking on the same topic. And this had to do with healing. And one of them, it was an academic lecture and the other one spoke with the authority that he knew that he was speaking truth. And it made all the difference. I, you know, in my own mind, when I was in college, I could listen to different teachers and I knew the ones who were speaking truth. I didn't think of those words, but you know, some I knew to believe, they spoke with authority that led me to believe that they knew the truth. Um, and that's how Jesus spoke, not like scribes, but as one having authority. So this is a topic that, you know, I there could have been four lessons on chapter one alone. But he does suggest in chapter two that there are things to, that you can contemplate that increase 
your sense of awe in the face of this mystery. And I know that in the memorial service, and it's from Khalil Gibran, who says, it's not death that is a mystery, it's life that is the mystery. You know, because death is just a phase of life, but life, two cells come together, and out of that comes a universe with this potential that, you know, what is awesome to think about, I like to think about this, that uh, because this is something that Charles Fillmore, what it was revealed to him, that if you had a certain number of people, and this is what he called building the Church of Christ, you had a certain number, number of people who were all sitting in the silence together all around the world. You didn't have to be in the same room. You know, you could have some in China and some in, um, some in Egypt and some in various states of the United States and all over the world. You could do this in like little islands here, there, and everywhere, groups of two or three, or maybe six, sitting together. And these were the days when they were given something to contemplate each month. You know, God is all goodness and everywhere present. This is a class thought. And then they could enter the silence. It's like a preparation for silence. And that uh, statement of truth would bring to them an experience of it on the level of their awareness. And that as a result of that, it could be the army of the Lord that would quell the violence that would quell the violence because there's great turmoil with global chemicalization going on. Don't we have kind of a tumultuous world? Global chemicalization. Because more light has been coming on to our planet since the ascension of Jesus. You know, what Jesus did for us, this is really what he did for us for which we can be grateful. He poked a hole. There's, there was this dense layer of human thought all in, enclosing the earth. It was like we were trapped in our own limitations. And Jesus had that perfected consciousness of a laser beam. He poked through it and opened up what we call the fourth dimension, like a little hole there. And the light came through, which is why we can enter the silence and transcend to that dimension. Thank you, Jesus. And so, and now it's easy. Anybody enters the silence now and can experience that dimension out of which Everything is provided to quell the violence in the world. I like to think about what would happen if we just had a group of six and started groups here, there, and everywhere. In fact, that's what the new foundation is about. Um, and just have our own experiment. And People had to make a commitment in those days of the Fillmores. They made a commitment to go into the silence, a minimum of twice. Um, but if they agreed to pray with silent unity at all the different times, they could do three, four, or five times a day. And Charles Fillmore said, uh, it wasn't the right time, but that the time would come when this was the solution, because the solution for everything is there. Well, and the whole 
whole Maharishi thing. You know, well, trying to do the percentages to. Yeah, but then that became commercial. It became, you know. You know, it was a oh, way. Yeah. yeah, it got twisted. Mm -hmm. So the motive was wrong. The intention was wrong. But if your intention is to bring that um, that inner peace and project inner peace into a troubled world, that's a different story. Um, and um, we have exactly two minutes left in our broadcast. And um, so um, you, I know there are people out there who are watching and listening. And please do email me so I'll know who you are. Um, and so let's close our eyes for a moment and just know that every good desire, it's ultimately for an increased awareness of the presence of God, which is to be expressed through a particular path of activity. That each of us is like a lily in the process of unfolding. And for that awareness of that beauty and power and truth that lies within us, we are so grateful. Amen. So we'll continue next week. Um, how many weeks is this? Are we, are we, are we? I said four, but um, you know, I <laughs> I have gone over <laughs> in the past. Um, so thank you all for watching. If you are watching at home, the reason, one reason why I'm happy to have people around me is that I'm.